the last thing before we go tonight, protecting our democracy. Our democratic institutions threatened like we have to defend our democratic institutions against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We cannot take our democratic institutions for granted. What is at stake in all of this is nothing less than our democracy. And we will protect our democracy. The Supreme Court is considered a sacred component of the United States system of checks and balances, which is considered to be one of the most democratic features of American democracy. Though in recent times, the Supreme Court has come under fire for the Roe v. Wade decision that allowed states to outlaw abortion and contraception. The U.S. Supreme Court has also recently rejected President Joe Biden's extremely moderate climate change policies to regulate emissions, and they also struck down his very modest plan to relieve student debt. Why does the Supreme Court, a supposed bastion of U.S. democracy, frequently go against the will of the majority of Americans? Is it just because the Republicans under Donald Trump stacked the Supreme Court with ultra-conservative judges? Well, yes, but the problem runs much deeper. What if I told you that the U.S. Supreme Court was designed to be a check against democracy from the very start? And not only that, the even bigger pill to swallow is that the United States system of checks and balances as a whole is structured to be undemocratic. Now, some of what I'm about to show you in this video is already fairly well known by many critical historians, but some of what you're going to hear in this video is fairly unknown to most people, especially Americans. Now, for starters, it's worth considering the class interests and openly anti-democratic sentiments of the American system's founding architects, which should at the very least make you a little bit skeptical of the system they designed. The framers of the US Constitution made no secret of the fact that the American political system was designed to divide and conquer the working majority. James Madison, key architect of the US Constitution, literally called it divide a impera. In the Federalist Papers, Madison was quite explicit that the US electoral system was deliberately structured to preserve the spirit and form of popular government, but to take away its substance so that a quote, unjust and interested majority could not quote, discover their own strength and act in unison with each other, and invade the rights and freedoms of the propertied classes. This method of dividing and conquering the population has been well documented by historians, but it is rarely emphasized just how much the decentralization of political power can actually serve an undemocratic function itself. When it comes to the undemocratic nature of the United States and other countries, most people solely focus on the concentration of unaccountable power in the hands of the central government especially within the national security agencies. Okay, unless you're already in the know, prepare to have your brain explode. The separation of powers, widely seen as one of the most democratic features of US democracy, is actually one of the system's most undemocratic features. Decentralization is typically assumed to go hand in hand with democracy, and the separation of powers sounds like quite an appealing concept, even to those on the left, as it coincides with the common sense notion that power corrupts. According to most mainstream conceptions of the US government, the purpose of the separation of powers is to prevent a monarch, dictatorship, abuse of power, or the tyranny of one faction. But in reality, the main tyrant that the US founders of the constitution were trying to protect against was none other than their own people, or as James Madison called them, the quote, tyranny of the majority. Contrary to the famous dictum of we the people, the real function of the separation of powers is the separation of the people from power. Democracy is supposed to be about power to the people, but the separation of powers in practice actually takes power away from the people. Far from preventing the tyranny of any unaccountable state authoritarianism, we know that doesn't work, or the protection of minorities, unless you're talking about the rich, the actual function of the US separation of powers is to limit political democracy to a propertied minority, while preventing economic democracy for the propertyless majority. Far from being a government built on the meaningful consent of the governed, the American system of checks and balances makes it practically impossible for the demands of most citizens to be implemented without the consent of at least a significant portion of a ruling class minority. The undemocratic functions and origins of each branch of government, and that includes the presidency, the Supreme Court, the Senate, and even Congress, are described in detail throughout the book titled We the Elites, How the U.S. Constitution Serves a Few, by Robert Ovitz. I highly recommend giving it a read. Within America's matrix of political judicial institutions, for the demands of regular citizens to be implemented, policy proposals must somehow pass through the House, the Senate, 
where most bills famously go to die, and avoid a presidential veto, and avoid being struck down as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Not to mention the fact that most members of Congress, Senators, Supreme Court Justices, and the Executive Branch are heavily influenced by their corporate donors and policy advisors, who often have corporate ties and or have been groomed in elite institutions and fed ruling class ideology. If you want a really good book that proves this in great detail, I would highly recommend the sociologist G. William Domhoff's Who Rules America. And the dominant classes and wealthiest elites of society do not need to be united to have their way with the US government. The elite minority needs to only win once in this process to prevent change and maintain the status quo. As a result, even the most watered-down compromises not favored by the corporate rich have been prevented from being passed. And there are many examples of policies that have a lot of popular support being blocked by just a tiny section of the US government. A contemporary example is how the fossil fuel industry was able to subvert Joe Biden's climate change policies by lobbying and funding Senator Joe Manchin, who was able to single-handedly block Joe Biden's Build Back Better legislation. Far too many liberals, conservatives, and even leftists place blame on individual politicians and their partisan affiliations rather than the system itself. Each of them claiming to uphold the Constitution and paying fidelity to America's democratic institutions. Now one would think that a system that is so deeply undemocratic would undergo major reform. Yet the insurmountable threshold needed to change the US Constitution makes the prospect of radical systemic change nearly impossible. Any proposal to change the US Constitution must achieve two-thirds support in the Senate and House of Representatives, and must get three-quarters approval from the states. Despite over 11,000 attempts to amend the US Constitution over the past two centuries, the Constitution has only been amended during this time a mere 27 times. 27 times in about 230 years. That means that in the past 230 years, changing the US Constitution has had a success rate of a mere 0.00245%. The US Constitution is the oldest constitution still in effect, and has not seen a single major change in the past three decades. I mean, even Thomas Jefferson thought the Constitution should change every 40 years. US politicians zealously invoke the Constitution like it's biblical scripture. The near impossibility of reforming the US Constitution is further ensured by the Supreme Court, which is arguably the most undemocratic obstacle to systemic change in the United States. The Supreme Court can single-handedly strike down or roll back legislation that it deems to be in conflict with the Constitution, no matter how popular it is or even if it managed to pass through the House and Senate. The Supreme Court is in many ways kind of like a judicial aristocracy. Supreme Court justices are appointed by the president rather than being elected by the people, and they are virtually unaccountable to the public. They also have life tenure, meaning that they get to serve until they're dead. And they can be removed from office only for misconduct through impeachment by the House and conviction by a two-thirds vote after a trial in the Senate. In the 2021 version of his classic book, Who Rules America?, G. William Domhoff calls the US Supreme Court a bastion of corporate dominance, the ultimate protector of the interests of the corporate community. Seriously, I highly recommend picking up this book, or at least checking out his lectures on YouTube. They're really interesting, and very accessible. Throughout most of its history, the Supreme Court's members have came mainly from backgrounds in corporate law, and have more often than not made decisions favorable to corporate power and against the rights of labor unions. In fact, it has been well documented that Supreme Court justices have issued hundreds of decisions involving corporations in which they own stock. I'm not kidding. Supreme Court justices literally being in charge of cases involving companies which they literally have stock in. Talk about a conflict of interests. Despite all this, many hopeful left-leaning Americans still believe that, although deeply flawed, the US political system still allows the possibility for a democratic socialist to attain the presidency, and implement their policies designed to serve the working majority, while weakening the corporate rich. What they fail to accept is that the uniquely undemocratic institutional features of the American system make the success of a socialist party, and more importantly, the actualization of the interests of its constituency, almost impossible. That is, assuming they recognize the legitimacy of these institutions. And given how many liberals and leftists believe the fear-mongering that Donald Trump was going to undermine America's supposed democratic institutions, it is unlikely that they would be willing to go against these institutions to implement their agendas, even though they're literally designed to prevent them. American Social Democrats think that they can just do what countries like France, Denmark, and Sweden did, 
and vote in a democratic socialist party. But America is different, and it has a system that makes these things virtually impossible. Many have asked the question, why no socialism in America? And there are many reasons as to why America has historically lacked a socialist tradition compared to other countries in the world, and how many of its democratic socialist movements have been contained. But most people don't seem to recognize that the American system's uniquely undemocratic structures foreclose the very possibility of a democratic socialism, even if a socialist politics was more popular, at least that is within the current system's institutional arrangement. Not only that, but most American leftist social democrats fail to consider the limitations of past social democracy in European countries, and the fact that these countries had more radical communist movements on the horizon before social democratic parties were elected, as the presence and popularity of communist movements allowed the social democratic reformists to be positioned as a less radical compromise in contrast. And not to mention the tragic failures of the more radical attempts at electoral socialism in countries like Chile. For more on this subject on the topic of so-called democratic socialism, I highly recommend watching Second Thoughts video on why social democracy is not enough. And that is not to say that socialism should not be democratic. It should absolutely be democratic, with a socialist conception of liberty that gives real economic democracy to the working majority. There'll be a video series on socialist alternatives in the future on this channel at some point, so definitely hit subscribe and the notification bell if you want to stay tuned. Now the idea that the system is fundamentally rigged against you might seem like quite a depressing pill to swallow, yet those who encourage you to be naively optimistic about working within a system deliberately designed to block the type of policies that you want only ends up serving the powers that be. These optimistic, moderate social democrats often consider their politics to be pragmatic and realistic. In reality, many of these practical reformists are themselves drinking from the fountain of ideology which gets them drunk enough to avoid facing the sobering reality of the present situation. Those who tell you to just have hope in a fundamentally broken system are really just selling you cope. Just imagine if the leaders of the American Revolution had the same delusional mentality about the British Empire and their deranged system that upheld the divine right of kings. The creation of the American Republic in 1776, which inspired many democratic movements across the world, was only possible once enough people abandoned their faith in the institutions of the British monarchy and no longer recognized its legitimacy. In a time marked by increasing nihilism and a profitable industry of false hopes, perhaps a diligent first steps Americans can take to improve democracy is to find tenacity in faithlessness. If you enjoyed this video and get educational value out of my work, consider becoming a patron. It helps me put out videos more frequently, and it also gets you access to my Discord and a nice backlog of exclusive content. If you're still here, just remember, a strong centralized government capable of acting in accordance with the general will of its people, the will of the popular majority, is, in effect, more democratic than a government with checks and balances designed to curb policies that enhance economic democracy. I'll let you think about that for a little while.